Welcome everyone. I'm Angie Moxley with Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville, Georgia. I support this webinar technology for our University of Georgia Extension and would like to introduce you to the host of this webinar series. Dr. Dan Suter is a professor of urban pest management in the Department of Ethnology at the University of Georgia. Um, he is located on the UGA Griffin campus. Dr. Suter has worked with the pest control industry since 1987. Dan would like to welcome you and introduce you to our speaker. Dan? Well, thank you, Angie. Uh, so th this presentation will be for those of you who do uh, cockroach and bed bug work, which would be every one of you, right? So uh, uh, let me introduce Dr. Scharf here. I've known Mike now for probably 20 years, but uh, Dr. Scharf is currently the O.W. Rollins Orkin Chaired Professor in the Department of Entomology at Purdue University in West Lafayette, uh, Indiana. His research program focuses on uh, basic physiology, toxicology, and applied aspects of uh, urban pest biology, mainly termites and cockroaches. He teaches a course in insect toxicology at Purdue. Uh, Mike received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees from Purdue in 1991, 1993, and 1997. Uh, after that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Nebraska and then Cornell, and an assistant and associate professor at the University of Florida be before joining Purdue in his current role. So uh, welcome, Mike, and the floor is now yours. Thanks very much. It's really nice to uh, to be here to give this talk today. This was a new experience for me, and I'm I'm really looking forward to it. So, so I'm just going to jump right in here and um, go to this first slide here. And so I always like to start this this talk. It's this is a talk that I've given many times, and just modify it a little every year as I go. But just a little disclaimer, and I like to say that resistance to insecticides, it happens, and it can happen to any insecticide. And so when I mention insecticides or products, I'm not picking on them or the manufacturers who make them. It's just that, you know, resistance can happen, and it, and it does. And so the goal of this talk is really to, to help pest management professionals to, to better preserve effective products while at the same time consistently achieving satisfactory control. So, you know, the whole idea is that it's all about sustainability. How can we keep these effective insecticides effective for as long as possible? So that's kind of the, where I'm coming from with this, with this talk that I'm giving. Um, just a, a brief outline. I, I want to talk about, you know, just some cockroach biology first and pest status and and talk about um, gel baits, of course, which are a big part of the market, um, and then get into what exactly is resistance and, and use some examples from the cockroach world to talk about that. And then, and then I'll come back over and apply some of those concepts and show how they are also relevant in bed bugs, and then finish up the talk with hopefully some very useful information for everybody um, on, um, down here on, on resistance management strategies which is an area where we're really active currently because um, in, in terms of research, um, we, we just haven't had the, the knowledge to build on. And so we're trying to do research today that to really define um, how resistance management strategies um, can best be implemented by professionals out there. So just to jump into German cockroaches, I think probably this is the first thing we learn about, first pests we learn about in the industry usually um, but, you know, what are the factors that make them pests? So, you know, number one is they're, you know, they're really high reproductive potential. So we have, you know, a female German cockroach has an egg case and they can carry up to, you know, 45 um, first instar cockroaches can come out of that egg case. So it's, you know, it's a huge reproductive potential from one female. Um, of course, they're they, they can be aesthetic pests, you know, just their presence. You know, cockroaches are creepy. People hate them in general. Um, and they have that smell, you know, that really characteristic odor that we all know. You know we can walk into a, an apartment or a, a restaurant and know immediately when, when roaches are there by that smell. Uh, also, though, things we know today that, we, for example, we didn't know when I was a student 
is that cockroaches are really significant health pests also. They can carry foodborne bacteria. Um, it's, it's still debatable as to whether or not they can actually mechanically um, or biologically transmit them, but they can certainly carry them. And also, um, something I know about very well is that cockroaches can produce, they produce at least six really significant human allergens that can be, for people that are sensitive to these allergens, they can be, you know, really um, potent to those, to those people. And so we, we, we like to say today that, you know, cockroach management is equivalent to allergen management. It's uh, the two go hand in hand. And of course we know that today from about 50 years of research actually that cockroaches are really highly prone to developing insecticide resistance and that's what I'm going to get into here in, in most of this talk. Um, so just a, a recent history of cockroach control. You know, for, for a long time we had traditional spray and dust bait, uh, dust based control tools for cockroach control and this was the industry standard from you know, the 1940s all the way till the mid 1990s. And so at about that time, along came this piece of legislation, at least in the US, called the, the Food Quality Protection Act. And this led to a lot of um, changes in how we use insecticides. Um, you know, mostly it led to the cancellation of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, that's the, the organophosphates and the carbamates. Um, it eliminated um, that the act, FQPA Act, um, eliminated indoor broadcast applications. Redefined what harm is, so we could we redefined harm as being you know an effect on gene expression in um, somebody who's exposed to an insecticide, rather than you know an effect like that we could see like neurotoxicity. We're defining harm based at the on the molecular level at this point, and there was increased emphasis on protecting children with the Food Quality Protection Act. So. So this you know, led to some really sweeping changes at about the same time in the late 1990s in the U.S. Bates received uh, food handling labels from the Environmental Protection Agency and so you know, that, that kind of created that, that um, opportunity to use Bates in a lot more places than we could previously. Um, and so you know, the consequences of the Food Quality Protection Act and label changes were that mostly here that the, the urban pest management industry moved to gel baits in a very big way. And secondarily, some people like myself can argue that um, this led to the resurgence of bed bugs that we see today because we are no longer broadcasting insecticides all over indoor environments. We couldn't do that legally anymore. And so that maybe this is one of the factors that contributed to the resurgence of bed bugs. And I'm sure there are people out there who will debate me on that point, but this isn't the venue for that. Um, so, so then along came the gel baits, and so you know they were really fantastic. You could cost effectively deploy them. Um, they're very um, compatible with with integrated pest management. Um, we had a lot of new low impact active ingredients that came along with insecticides. Um, they're very palatable formulations. Cockroaches, you know they. They just eat them immediately when you put them out. You can actually, I've heard many, many reports and I've seen it myself of people getting the, you know, the, the cockroaches to eat the gel bait right out of the applicator. I mean, cockroaches just love these formulations. And, um, you know, and one of the questions that came up was, would there be a reduced resistance risk? And, and this is because the cockroaches would be eating, the, the gel baits are so palatable that they, they get a very lethal dose of the insecticide um, because they're eating so much of the bait. And so, you know, that people thought there would be a reduced um, risk for resistance. And so that actually wasn't true, um, although these gel baits did survive much longer than residual insecticides. And, and I'll talk some more about this as we go here. So I, I always like to talk about, you know, bring it back to the whole IPM approach because it's fundamental. You know, everything we do in, in urban pest management should be centered around integrated pest management. And so five steps for effective cockroach baiting are, are listed here. We have you know, inspection, identification, recommendation, treatment uh, and implementation, and then the evaluation and follow-up. 
So with the inspection, you know, that's where you want to interview the customer. You want to do a physical inspection to find all the places where cockroach are, cockroaches are and where the conducive um, conditions are. And we want to use traps to, to um, monitor the populations, if at all possible, to because um, we can't physically see every roach that's there and see every location. So trapping is very effective. Of course, you want to do uh, um, the correct identification. You, know, you want to be sure that you're dealing with the right pest species that you think is there. You want to get a good handle on the population size and the structure of that population as well. Um, and then also identify conducive factors that you know, lead to those huge cockroach populations, such as uh, moisture problems and, and sanitation issues. And then the, the recommendation phase is really um, very useful. Um, talk about what the pest manager, what, what you're going to do, and also what the customer needs to do to make your program the most effective. So that's, that's also very critical. And then when we jump over here to the treatment and implementation phase, you know, sanitation and exclusion are very, very key. Sanitation is important because if you're using baits, right, it's a food material. You want to eliminate all the competing food so the, the roaches will eat as much of the bait as possible. So you get as much of that, of that bait as you can into the population. And of course, we know that we can have secondary and tertiary kill because cockroaches like to eat the feces of their, their friends that are living next to them. So you can um, have a lot of secondary and tertiary um, kill with a lot of our different bait active ingredients. So sanitation ups the odds for all that happening very effectively. Um, exclusion is really important too, particularly in a, a, a apartment or multi-house um, housing unit type situation where you can have cockroaches moving between apartments or flats and, and gaining access and coming and going. So exclusion is really important. And then finally we can think about the chemical control. You know, that's the time to implement the bait and be very thorough and be sure you're getting the bait to the cockroaches. You know, you want to get it within five feet of where they're harboring, if at all possible, um, to um, ensure that they're going to get as much, consume as much bait as possible. And then we have our continual monitoring and follow-up, um, continual emphasis on environmental, environmental management and retreatment as necessary. So, so when you do all these things correctly, you would expect to see the cockroach populations um, tapering off. But um, you know, but what happens when when repeated control failures occur? I think then is when we can start to ask the question: Is resistance an issue here? And so, and so that's where I want to go next: is you know, what exactly is resistance? So we can define it in a lot of different ways, but I just like to um, define it as a control failure that results from repeated use of the same insecticide over and over again. So in the lab, you know, we can, we can study resistance and we can see how cockroach, cockroaches can adapt very quickly in a lab environment, but that doesn't always equate to control failures. And so we like to define, at least I do from my academic perspective and in an applied sense, is to define, define resistance as a control failure. And so resistance evolution, it follows, and we, and we know this through decades of research, that it, it follows Darwinian evolutionary principles. And so you know, we may not all be um, evolutionary biologists out there, so I'll just kind of walk through this. Um, but you know, we can say it's pre-adaptive uh, pre and selectable. So what, what does that mean? So if we jump down here to this, this um, little picture, we have you know, several um, red spots here at the beginning. So those are, if each circle is a, a cockroach in a population, the, the red ones are ones that have that natural ability to be become resistant. So that's just how nature works. You know, there's that adaptability built in. And so if we jump over here, five generations we've treated with the same insecticide. So that's about a year and a half or uh, two years in, in cockroaches. And so we see the number of red individuals increasing in that population. And if we don't switch insecticides and we keep going, we get out here to generation 10 and we see that we have, you know, all resistant 
individuals in the population. And that's a result of all the little red ones surviving and passing their genes on to the next generation. And so that's what we mean by resistance being pre-adaptive and selectable. So when we select, we're selecting for those individuals that are carrying resistance genes. And so in cockroaches, we usually say that re resistance is usually an inevitable consequence of insecticide use. So almost always, if, if we select a population, we can see it getting pushed towards resistance uh, at different rates depending on the insecticide and in the situation, but it usually happens. There are very, some, there are very rare cases out there where resistance hasn't happened to certain insecticides. And really the only example I can give you of that is, is boric acid uh, today. So, um, and I think maybe that's just because we haven't looked at it carefully enough to see if resistance has actually happened. But people say that, resist, that boric acid still works, you know, kind of no matter what, under a number of um, conditions. So that's a bit on resistance evolution. And so what causes resistance to happen? Uh, so we can say that there are two general categories of resistance mechanisms, and those are physiological and behavioral. And so back here on physiological, we can think about, um, so when we have an insecticide, we can think about it, it interacts with a target site within the insects, and that's like a key fitting into a lock. So the insecticide is a key and it has a very specific target site that it interacts with. So the key fits in the lock and you can open the lock and that would be equivalent to um, uh, having toxicity happen. And so we can have these kinds of physiological resistance where we have enzymatic digestion. So that would be like filing the, the teeth off the key so it no longer fits in the lock. We've degraded the insecticide with enzymes in the insect. You can have target site sensitivity. So that would be like a change in the lock, so the insecticide can't interact with the target site anymore. And then another one is reduced cuticular penetration. So that can be a movement of the insecticide through the insect cuticle, or in the case of a bait, that can be, you know, when the insect consumes the bait, it has to move through the gut lining to, to go into the body and interact with its target sites in the body, right? So most of our insecticides are are neurotoxins. So a bait insecticide has to be ingested, has to move through the gut, travel through the body, and reach target sites in the nervous system. And so there are a lot of these biological barriers that, that can prevent the insecticide from reaching its target site. And so, and then the other one we hear a lot about is behavioral uh, resistance or aversion is the term that we see a lot in the marketing literature. And and so this can be avoidance of the active ingredient, or it can be avoidance of inert formulation components. And the big one we've heard a lot about is a glucose aversion in the, in the German cockroaches. And so, for example, it just so happens that glucose is, um, it can be repellent to certain individuals that have a mutation in the population. It's, and it's, it's like a, has the same effect of, as on the roaches as if they were eating something that's intensely bitter. So a portion of the population will avoid the glucose and thus avoid the insecticide in the bait and, and we can have this behavioral resistance happening. So the, our manufacturers figured that out about 20, 15, 20 years ago and you know, are no longer using glucose as a component in their bait. So it's not so much of an issue to my knowledge. Okay, so we can have um, think about residual insecticides versus bait insecticides, and they can select for different types of resistance. So over here on the residual spray side, we typically think of residual sprays as selecting for physiological rather than behavioral resistance because the insects are just being exposed to these things. It really doesn't depend on their behavior so much for them to be exposed to residual insecticides. So as a consequence, we've seen these you know, metabolism, target site, penetration types of resistance happening. But with gel baits, because we have that really strong behavioral component with feeding behavior, so we can see physiological and behavioral resistance developing kind of in parallel. And this, in fact, is what science has, has pointed out to us, that we do see these, these two kinds of things happening. So it can be, a, can be really complex 
um, complex suites of resistance mechanisms. Um, we have resistance to gel baits. And that's a big part of the research, and that's something I hope to be able to share in more detail with the industry as we learn more uh, in a couple of years from now. Okay, so I teach toxicology, as, as Dan pointed out um, in the intro, and so I like structures a lot, and I know you know, in urban pest management, we aren't really organic chemists, but so I apologize, but I like to look at these structures and I'm, when I'm thinking about different insecticide groups. And so the point of this slide is to show how we've had all these different insecticides that have hit the market over the years, going back to 1953 with chlorine, um, or even before that. And, and in short order, we had resistance develop. And that's what the years I have shown here with each of the insecticide groups are the first year that a report of resistance was documented in the refereed literature, or at least was um, um, established as, as being valid. And so we can see chloridane, pyrethrins, DDT, chlorpyrifos, bendiocarb, cy cypermethrin in 1998. That's when resistance was first appearing to all these things. And then we jump over here on the bait side. So fipronil resistance was first reported in 2003, abamectin in 2004. There was one small report of hydromethylone resistance in 2010. And people have um, um, said similar to me um, in conversations that there's some issues with hydromethylone that pop up every now and then. Um, we've seen doxycarb resistance at high levels in the lab recently, and I'll, I'll show you some of those results here shortly. And then we have dinotepuron, which is a newer AI resistance, hasn't been reported yet. It hasn't been in the market that long. But, you know, like I said at the beginning, not picking on any insecticides here. We think that resistance can evolve to anything that's out there. And so this is just kind of a really quick history of, of how resistance has evolved. And hopefully it makes the case of how fast it can happen if we don't use the products wisely. So um, when, when I was a graduate student, now like 20 to 25 years ago, I had this question that was burning in my brain, and it was, how fast can resistance evolve in cockroaches in the lab? And, and so the short answer to that is we can see changes in one generation. So you know, we can push, with insecticide exposure, we can push um, in the cockroaches towards a, a higher resistance level, and it, that we can detect in, a, in one generation. And so this was my PhD research in the, in the mid-1990s. And what I did was I collected a, a field strain that was really highly pyrethroid resistance, resistant and had some organophosphate resistance. And I crossed that strain to a susceptible laboratory strain and created a hybrid population. So I took their offspring and then I selected them for four consecutive generations at the 40 to 90 percent level with the two insecticides, uh, chlorpyrifos or cypermethrin. So I created two separate populations. And what this, what the data show here in this graph are that over four generations with each of the different insecticides, the LT99 jumps up in a stairwise or a stair step kind of way. And so what the LT99 is, if we look up here, that's the time it basically takes to kill 100% of the roaches that you would expose in a surface contact assay here. So that we would use a, a jar with uh, insecticide treated in that jar. And so you can see the time it takes to kill all of them is, is, is jumping up at a very rapid rate. And so here by the end of four generations, it took you know, a tremendous amount of time for them to stand on label rate of insecticide for them to be affected by it. So, so this just, I hope, makes the case that um, just in one generation, you can push their susceptibility levels way down or, or push the resistance levels up. If the resistance genes are present, uh, you can select populations very quickly. The hard part is knowing up front if those resistance genes are there. And that feeds some of the recommendations that I'm going to be um, giving you later. So it can happen quickly. And so here I want to jump to a more recent example with gel baits, right? The previous example was insecticides that we can't use anymore, at least in the U.S., in indoor environments. So 
we, we've been regulated away from using those. So I want to give you an example with gel baits next. It follows kind of the same principles. So we started this work, and this was with um, Advion insecticide, which has the active ingredient of endoxicarb. And at the time, it was produced by DuPont. Today, it's produced or marketed by Syngenta. So that's why you see, you may not see this kind of labeling anymore. But the active ingredient is endoxicarb. And so with this study, we, we worked with pest control professionals. And we collected populations from around the US. And you can see those shown here on the map. And um, one in particular is down here from Cocoa Beach, Florida, that we collected two year or one year apart. So we had population, we collected it one year, and then we came back a year later after it had been exposed to some insecticide and, and looked at it again. And I'll show you those, those results. And so what we did was uh, we used a bait feeding assay. So this picture kind of shows it here. We had little blank bait matrix pellets. And we treated them with a, a smaller dose of insecticide that actually occurs in the um, for, formulated product. And the reason we did this is we wanted to be able to see, give them a lower dose of insecticide so we could see maybe resistance at its very early or incipient stages of development. And what the graph here shows is the percent mortality at three days or 72 hours for the, all these different populations that we collected shown up. On, up on the y-axis here. And we can see, for the most part, over here, that most of our, pro our uh, populations were still very susceptible to the insecticide. But if we jump up here, we can see some populations that were um, starting to show early stages of resistance. And again, I want to make the point here that this is done with a lower, like less than half the label rate of the active ingredient in doxycarb. So we're able to see uh, resistance look a little more apparent here. If, if these all of these populations would have 100% mortality if they had eaten the actual formulated um, commercial product. So this is again for research purposes. But we could see some variation in susceptibility across the populations. And so I want to jump here to the next slide. And if you look here at the the, the two red um, bars. So that's that Cocoa Beach, Florida population collected in 2008. And then later we came back in 2009. And after they had been treated with um, doxycarb and fipronil containing baits, and possibly some chlorphenopyr also. So probably three insecticides they had been exposed to. But you can see their resistance level kind of doubled. Or the converse um, statement to that would be that their susceptibility dropped by half in this case. So you can see with field exposure how quickly um, with exposure to insecticides their, their resistance levels can increase. And so this was a really kind of eye-opening result for us that the first time something like this had been done in the field where we could actually see their resistance levels building. And I should point out too that this Cocoa Beach population, it was actually collected from a school, a high school, um, which is, you know, high school kids in the uh, ninth to twelfth grade. And it was in a culinary arts, so it was like a place where they learned how to cook. So there was a lot of a lot of food contamination around. It was a really tough environment to try to get um, effective cockroach control in. So maybe that was part of it too. But um, nonetheless we saw this resistance increase pretty quickly. And I here I want to jump again to then so we also, at around the same time, were able to collect a field population that we know had been exposed. This is called the Mid-Florida population collected in the Orlando, Florida area. They had been exposed to Advion for a couple of years. And we can see that um, the red circles here. So this is actually, if we do a, an assay in the lab where we give them the formulated gel bait, in this case, it was their only food source. And we only gave them water in addition to that we had only 5% mortality by, uh, 5 to 10% mortality by three weeks in that population. So this is what I would call a highly resistant population. And it did come from an account where there was a, a control failure, a pretty prominent control failure. And up here, if we, this is our, the black circles are our susceptible um, Johnson & Wax laboratory strain. You can see by 
by day three, they had 100% mortality. So this is an example of from the field, we can have a really high level of resistance happening to endoxicarb. And basically over here, this is a, in, in B, this is a vial assay where we actually coat the vial, these vials with um, the active ingredient and put the roaches in. So we're giving them a, a surface contact kind of exposure. And we can see 0% mortality in the mid Florida strain as well at, at low and high concentration of the insecticide. So this just makes the case that um, yes, indeed, very high level resistance to gel baits can happen and it, and it has happened. Again, I'm not picking on Advion or Indoxicarb. I think this can happen with any insecticide. So that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so I want to shift gears here. We're pretty much staying on time and I talk about bed bugs and resistance in bed bugs briefly. Um, so, I mean, we know bed bugs are huge. They're the, you know, the biggest thing in urban entomology right now and probably a huge component still globally in the, the pest control market. And so here's just a brief history of bed bug insecticide resistance. And so with DDT, which came along very soon, you know, I think it was one of the reasons why bed bugs went from an important pest to virtually a non-important pest very quickly is because we had DDT starting in the 1940s. But by 1948, DDT resistance was documented in bed bugs in Hawaii and then um, various other locations around the globe um, up, up until the early 1970s. Um, jumping here to organophosphates, Israel, the USSR, and then um, Denmark documented OP resistance in 2011. But it's been around a while. Um, cyclodiene resistance also happened by the 1960s. And then today, of course, we know that pyrethroid resistance is a huge problem in, in bed bugs. And so um, we saw in the US, with, in Kentucky and Ohio, many documented cases between 2007 in 2011, uh, researchers in Korea very significantly documented resistance in 2010, and then in Denmark in 2011. So, um, you know, pyrethroid resistance is prominent in bed bugs. And so, why is that? So, um, again, this is some molecular biology info, so I'm not going to delve too deeply into it because I know that this probably isn't the right audience for this, but but there are mutations in the sodium channel of bed bugs that are very frequent, very common among bed bug populations. And so this is a target site type of physiological resistance. If you remember I talked about, it's kind of like if the key doesn't fit in the lock anymore, then we won't have the insecticide causing toxicity. And so we see these two mutations that happen in the sodium channel gene that give target site resistance to pyrethroids and DDT. And, and some of this might actually be a carryover from DDT use 50 years ago. So those genes are still present. And once pyrethroids came along, and we, we, we could select for those individuals again very quickly. So as a result, we need to be really careful with pyrethroid use in bed bugs. So use especially standalone. So products that have just pyrethroid, you know, you need to be really careful using them against bed bugs. Um, some other things we know about bed bugs are that this is from a, a, a paper coming out of the University of Kentucky a couple of years ago. And what they showed is that pyrethroids express, first of all, um, sorry, not pyre, um, bed bugs. Uh, if we look over here, like about her, yeah, the integument is about 50% of their body mass. So, you know, bed bugs, a huge amount of them is actually their exoskeleton. And within the exoskeleton, they express high levels of insecticide defense mechanisms. So they have detoxification enzymes, as well as their cuticle protein composition has shifted. And so they're really, in addition to having sodium channel mutations, uh, they're really well defended in their integument against insecticides. So that's another reason why bed bugs are so tough. Um, here's another paper, um, this, and this is the last one I'll, I'll show on the bed bug topic from the University of Kentucky from the Potter Lab, where they actually did a selection experiment like I talked about with cockroaches a little earlier, 
and they use these mixture products, so temperid and transport. So they have mixtures of pyrethroids and nicotinoids, which are typically very effective products that we have available to us still. And so what they did was they selected with temperid in bed bugs for one generation at the 80% level. And what they saw and they tested the survivors was that they had resistance not only to temperid, but cross resistance to the transport product. And I want to point out though, so this was all done in the laboratory. And we know that uh, you can select for resistance very quickly in the lab and in the field, it's much more complex. Resistance typically evolves more slowly because you have resistance genes being diluted by susceptible genes and we have insects moving around, um, coming into and moving out of the population. So it's a little more complex. Probably this is faster than we would expect to see uh, resistance evolve in the field. And so um, basically, I want to I jump down here. Resistance that was seen to these two different products, they had different pyrethroids in them, but the resistance was mainly to the pyrethroid component of the mixture. So even though there's a, a combination of the pyrethroid and the nicotinoid, you need them to both be effective. If you have, if you have resistance to one, these, these data presented here suggest that you have resistance to the mixture because you need to, even though it's a mixture, you need the two products together to actually work. So um, I guess my take home message here is that you don't want to rely, even if these products are effective, you don't want to rely on them for too long. You want to rotate even if they're a mixture product. That's, that's the key. And I'll talk about mixtures here in, in a little bit. I'm sorry, uh, rotations here in a little bit. And so that brings me to the, the final topic here in the last 15 minutes of resistance management. And this is where, you know, it, it really, I hope to bring it all together and give you some really useful information here. And so there are three general strategies, whether we're talking about cockroaches or bed bugs, three strategies are relevant for resistance management in urban pests. And those are um, insecticide rotations, insecticide mixtures, and non-chemical chemical integrated pest management. So these are the three ways we can break it down. So starting with uh, rotations, so um, rotations are the use of insecticides in sequence on a generational basis. So what we are recommending is to rotate um, active ingredients and formulations, um, so between them, baits and sprays. So don't use all baits and don't use all sprays. You know, try to rotate between the two. Um, but the caveat here is that we do need research to better define these parameters. So what I'm giving you here is the best recommendation that we can give at this time based on knowledge that's available. Um, we have research in progress and we hope to be able to maybe revise this or say we're right on target, but I, I doubt um, we're going we're gonna to have it perfect here, but it's the best we can do today. And so what we recommend with, with cockroaches, for example, we rotate from product one to product two to product three. And we want to have different active ingredients in these rotations as we're, as we're going through. And we're, we want to do it on a three-month basis. And so I'll kind of pose the question to everybody out there to make you think about it a little. Why do we say three months? So think about that for a second. And um, so, and I actually, I, I give you the answer here. And that's because the cockroach life cycle in a, very, in a relatively warm kind of climate is about three months. And so if you're treating on a monthly basis, you would want to go three months or three, uh, three monthly treatments with one product, then switch to product two, then product three. And so, um, and we want to be shifting active ingredients as much as we can in this. And I'll, and I'll tell you why that is here in a couple slides. But first, I want to point out that we have the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. Uh, they have a website, which I'll give you here, that provides um, mode of action classifications that can help you to choose insecticides to rotate in this way. So I'll jump here to the next slide. So this is a really busy kind of poster, but it's the IRAC, or the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, um, they update this poster every year, and it's available at this web address shown at the top. I'll, I'll give it to you later as well. 
And so they have each of these little boxes is a different mode of action category. And so what they would recommend is you just, and I know you can't see it here very well, but you pick insecticides from certain boxes and you just rotate through them as you go. And you know, try to find three products that will be really compatible in the environments that you're working in and, and, and test them out and see if they work. And um, so you have this resource available to you, which is, seems to be very valuable. I, I get a lot of positive feedback from, from people from the industry who I've kind of turned on to this, this resource. And I want to point out, sort of, uh, we have these recommendations that IRAC gives. I'm not going to go through them, but you have them here. I want to jump to the bottom and point out that Insecticide Resistance Action Committee is made up of all of our manufacturers. So they all have a say in um, how these, uh, of the activities of, of IRAC, basically. And so uh, it's done, um, this classification and rotation scheme is, is put forth with the endorsement of our manufacturers. And so I think that's really important. It's a, it's a really good thing, really positive development for the industry that we have this resource. So, so that's all I'd say about uh, rotations, and other than um, that, I personally, my opinion is that rotations are the best strategy we have available for resistance management. Um, with that being said, I'm going to jump to, oh, I want to point out also here that when you are rotating, you need to be aware that some bait and spray products or even bait products contain the same active ingredient. So here we have, on the left, we have Advion um, gel bait, and also we have Aralon insecticide. So those both have Indoxicarb as the active ingredient. So those are not compatible to rotate back to back. Jumping over here, we have different formulations of MaxForce. They have the same active ingredient, so probably they're not the best things to rotate between. Even though they might have a different bait matrix that would get at the behavioral part of resistance, they still have the same active ingredient. And then over here, we have some products available, at least in the U.S., with various alpine products in bait and spray formulations that have cockroaches on the label where we have dinotefuron as the active. So it's the same in these different bait and spray products. So it's really important to know what active ingredients you're dealing with when you're rotating. Okay, jump, jumping here now to mixtures. <clears throat> so mixtures are, they're out there. Um, they're, they can be really valuable. And I guess my, my main take home message for mixtures is don't rely on them exclusively. If you're using a mixture, or a mixture product, you still want to be rotating through different combinations of active ingredients. And so we have mixture products in this category. We have synergists, and we have insect growth regulators like um, Nancy Hinkle talked about a little bit with flea control. So jumping here to mixtures, I, we have so we have a lot of them. They all start with T in the U.S. Um, the, the trade names for the products. And they're usually a mixture of a pyrethroid and a nicotinoid, or they always are. So we're combining pyrethroids and nicotinoids here. These things can be very effective products, but again, it's my opinion that you don't want to rely on them exclusively. In terms of synergists, um, so these are things like piperonal butoxide, MGK264. Um, they inhibit detoxification enzymes, and so if you mix them with your conventional insecticide, where, where this kind of tank mix would be legal, um, you can get a boost of the insecticide performance by blocking um, detoxification enzymes in the in the insect. So, um, so that's the synergist. Also, it can be very effective. And then third here is the insect growth regulators. And so, um, when legal, uh, specified by the label, they can be tank mixed with conventional insecticides, and they interfere with insect growth and development rather than acting as neurotoxins like pyrethroids or nicotinoids, et cetera. So they can be very effective too. And I want to show you a, a little bit of data here in this next slide. So this is some, some work I actually did as a graduate student in the 1990s when we could actually, when it was permitted for us to use pyrethroids and insect growth regulators and broadcast sprays in indoor environments. We can't use the pyrethroids so much this way anymore like we could. We can use some of them, but, but not all of them. And so we had a population of cockroaches in public housing that was super highly pyrethroid resistant. 
And so we knew that we couldn't just use pyrethroids. So we did this experiment where in a, in a very tough environment for cockroach control, we treated, um, we had the population at the beginning, our trap catch was between 25 and 30 cockroaches per night per trap over um, about 17 apartments on average. So pretty high populations. We treated at the beginning with uh, pyrethroid, which is cyhalothrin in this case, plus an IGR, pure proxifen, plus PBO, the synergous piperoma butoxide. So that was here at the first month, first time we treated. And then we followed up with six uh, or five monthly treatments of um, pyrethroid plus IGR, so cyalothrin plus pyroproxicin for the five months subsequent to that. We can see in this really tough environment, we got pretty decent cockroach control. And then here by six months, we stopped treating um, altogether. And by 12 months, we had um, very much uh, fewer cockroach numbers present. So. So this is just an example of how a mixture can work. And I think actually to get back to a question that was raised with, in Nancy Heckel's talk with IGRs and uh, methoprene and hydroprene. So these insecticides are actually have some volatility, which means that that's how they can, you can treat in one place and get an effect across the room where you didn't treat. So these things actually have some degree of volatility. So that, that's another reason why they can be so effective. So this is just an example of a mixture. Some of the some of the only um, data, to my knowledge, that exists on long-term um, effects of a mixture product, a mixture combination in the field. Okay, and lastly, we have IPM and least toxic IP, IPM approaches, and this maybe. It could be the best resistance management because we're not using insecticides. So we're not selecting for those stereotypical resistance mechanisms in, in the insects. That can be cockroaches and bugs, bed bugs um, alike. And so we have, you know, sanitation is critical. You can limit the food that competes with, with bait, and it also reduces uh, clutter and reduces harborage and forces those insects out to where they can be exposed to the insecticide more or or vacuumed up, for example. Um, we can have exclusion, which is really important to keep pests moving from moving into and out of um, um, areas. Trapping works very well. Um, vacuuming, we did a, a research project with vacuuming about 25 years ago, and it is very labor intensive, but it's also some of the most fun I've ever had doing pest control. Um, it's just you know, vacuuming up roaches is very gratifying if you can do it. Um, I like to point out, too, that heat has some potential. There's some data from the 1990s. The U.S. Army tested heat as a way to control cockroaches in certain settings. It worked very well. And, of course, we have a lot of pest management professionals with heat application equipment available to them now thanks to, to bed bug work. And so maybe this is something we should be thinking about more. And of course, client communication through this whole process is really important. I've, I've heard the term integrated people management come up a lot. You know, IPM is, is as much about communication as it is about, you know, any other aspect of, of pest control. So, you know, these things can all work to your advantage for managing resistance. So I just want to bring it home now and finish up with some conclusions. Um, just to give you like six really major points here that I hope you can take away. Uh, insecticide resistance in German cockroaches and bed bugs was first noted over 50 years ago, believe it or not. So it, this is nothing new. It's something we've, we've been seeing for a long time. Um, insecticide resistance is a heritable evolutionary phenomenon that can move towards problem levels in a single generation. It's really important to consider. Um, the third point here, I didn't talk about this, but with, with uh, gel baits, pest management professionals can very easily, um, and, and contact insecticides, can test for resistance by, by treating, um, for example, a, a small jar, like a half liter or a liter sized jar. You can grease it around the top to confine the insects and put them on that residue or in there with some gel bait. And if they're alive 24 hours later, that's a pretty good indication that you have a resistance issue for that particular insecticide. So that can tell you it's time to rotate. 
so you can test on your own. Um, resistance, one of the big problems that I have as a, as a um, scientist and somebody who's trying to make recommendations to the industry is that resistance doesn't evolve the same way in every situation and to every insecticide. It, evolution is variable and the kinds of mechanisms and types of resistance we can have are incredibly variable. So it's really hard to generalize. Um, and so that's why we just say that um, here that product rotation and IPM are just paramount to being able to uh, have that sustainability, long-term sustainability in pest management. To keep the populations low, to keep the customers happy, uh, to, you know, to manage those health pests and, and, and keep our insecticides effective because it's, it's really a two-way street, right? You know, manufacturers need customers, but we as an industry need the manufacturers to be producing products that work for us too. So that's a key point. And also, the last one is use the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee a website as a resource for knowing what active ingredients you're dealing with and for developing rotation strategies and, and, and tailoring them to meet your needs and, and the accounts that you work in. Uh, for further reading, I, I would recommend we published an article in Pest Control Technology Magazine in their cockroach control issue in July 2013. You can see many of these same concepts in dissected in more detail that I've talked about here for the last hour. And, um, and I just want to finally finish by um, just acknowledging some people who've done a lot of the work I've presented here. Uh, Amea Gandelikar is a scientist, a, a faculty member who I work with here at Purdue, and he's done a lot of this resistance work in roaches. And Jesse Hotelling is our roach rancher. He takes care of a lot of our insects and, and makes it possible for us to do this work. Um, I'm supported by the Rollins and Orkin Endowment at Purdue and worked with DuPont and Syngenta on, on, on much of this work that I presented with gel baits at least. And we've gotten a lot of help over the years from pest management professionals with, with our roach collection. So real nice job, Mike. Uh, I hope everybody wrote down a lot of that information. There's a uh, uh, you know, from a from a perspective, if you look at uh, <clears throat> you know where the industry has been over the past 30 years, we have a lot fewer basic manufacturers bringing in a lot fewer active ingredients into the industry, and I think this talk really highlights the importance of trying to conserve conserve those products and those active ingredients. Because you know, I can remember 25 years ago there were 15 15 big product manufacturers and and uh, product developers in supporting the pest control industry and really it's just a handful now. Uh, I saw a talk several years ago that uh, imidacloprid, which was brought to market 25 years ago, the cost was $240 million 25 years ago to bring that active ingredient to market. So high cost and uh, uh, markets for the pest control industry really uh, put a lot of pressure on basic manufacturers uh, and so they're we're you know, we see a, a lot fewer, I think, active ingredients coming to the market. So it's critically important, critically yeah. important to conserve those those active ingredients. I would add today, Dan, the the estimate is over a billion dollars to get a product to market. So, gosh, that's just uh, that's that's up there with the price of a drug. Yes. So it's critically important to conserve what we have. So we do have a few questions, Mike. Uh, I had about eight or ten questions come in. I'll just kind of read these from the from the chat box, but somebody had a question about, uh, this was kind of a unique question about cockroaches developing resistance or aversion to, to aggregation pheromones. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? You know, some of the, some of our, some of our, our uh, sticky traps are, are beta with aggregation pheromones. Any, any, any thoughts there? Right. Um, well, I haven't worked on that and I've never seen data on it, but you can envision that you know, maybe there's a proportion of the population that doesn't like to aggregate. And so if we're trapping on a population with those attractants, we could be selecting for individuals that that don't like to aggregate. And so I'm I'm pretty sure that in the lab we could select for roaches like that. Mm. It's certainly possible. Yeah. This question comes from a local operator. He says that he's been using multiple types of insecticides for bed bug control, uh, repellent, non-repellents, growth regulators, that kind of thing. Besides those materials, are there any suggestions on stopping a recurrence after about 30 to 45 days? 
uh, uses uh, well, luminol and black lights to find trace evidence of eggs and new hatchlings in a home. So I guess any advice on, I guess the core of his question here is, do you have any advice on trying to stop a bed bug population after a month? I mean, that's, that's the huge thing in bed bugs, especially in kind of high rise settings. <clears throat> they just resurge because they're moving and people are moving them. And so it really gets over to the realm of that cultural IPM side of things. Bed bugs are not easy. So, uh, and, and just and rotate. I mean, try new products, um, you know, new active ingredients. I think that's the best advice I can give. Yeah, it all gets back to that rotation. So this question uh, comes to us from across the world. Uh, if a population of German cockroaches become resistant to endoxicarb, what classes of other insecticides might they be cross-resistant to? Yeah, it, it's really hard to generalize because, as I pointed out uh, there at the end, that resistance evolves differently in different populations. And so we don't, we don't have a great handle on that yet. Um, but I, I showed you a little bit of data that where um, we saw that change in the Cocoa Beach population after it had been ex exposed to endoxicarb, fipronil, and chlorfenopyr. So the resistance to endoxicarb increased. So, you know, it's possible that there could be some cross resistance, but between, for example, fipronil and doxycarb, but, but don't hold me to that. I mean, we just don't have the, the science to, to support that. It, it's, it's really hard to know. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is, might we ever see commercialized a, a glass vial type diagnostic tool for use by technicians in the field to screen for pyrethroid resistance? Is this viable? I know that this was my question, actually, and I know that there was some work done on this for cockroaches, and you had mentioned that in your last slide. What about for, for bed bugs? Yeah, uh, so we have a product out there. I'm not sure who's marketing it, but I know it's available at least in a small sector of the U.S. <clears throat> that um, gives the ability to test for um, contact insecticide resistance in bed bugs. Um, but short of doing that, I mean, it's it's very easy to, you know, get some of your your tank mixed insecticide, put a small amount, like I would say, you know, a half a milliliter. So if you can visualize what that is, um, put it in a jar, and and grease the top and let it dry and put the insects on it, and you can you can very quickly get some handle on if they're living or not. So. Um, so just put some live, put some live bugs in the wait, wait till the material dries. Put some live bugs in there out of the account, and if they're alive the next day, then you got problems. Right, and dry residue is important because if it's yeah. wet, it's going to probably kill them pretty quickly, or yeah. maybe drown them. So it's a little tougher. But. Yeah. So a, mil, a milliliter, you're talking about just a drop out of the end of a nozzle. Yeah. 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 A couple, just a little bit of material, right out of your tank. Yeah. So this question is about silica gel. I have several questions about uh, DE and silica gel, that kind of thing. Is is uh, silica gel a good option to avoid resistance in bed bugs? I definitely think so. Yeah, I believe that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's the right environment for it. So it's not going to work in all environments, but mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it works by um, abrading the insect cuticle and then they, they just kind of desiccate, so they you know they lose their water. So that's a very different mode of action than everything else we're dealing with. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up to that, but any idea how long it takes to kill an individual bed bug, uh, DE? This is kind of, a, kind of a, how long it might take to kill an individual bed bug, diatomaceous earth? Oh, wow, uh, I don't have a good basis no, but I would yeah. say it would be on the order of um, days, perhaps, mm -hmm. maybe three to five days. Yeah. So this question has to do with uh, selection of an individual best chemical to use when treating for bed bugs, and um, I, I, you know, I can answer that question. You should be rotating. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, How about any? Go ahead, Mike. Pyrethroids are. Pretty much uh, pyrethroids as a standalone, very low probability because of that 
you know, that sodium channel resistance I talked about. But pyrethroids combined with, you know, the mixture products, pyrethroids plus nicotinoids, um, a lot of different people are, are saying that it's working for them. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a good resource. Can, can we generalize about pyrethroids, Mike? Do you think that there's some some level, whether it be low to high pyrethroid resistance nationwide? It sure looks like that based on the, the scientific literature. So that, you know, the data, a lot of different laboratories have put in the literature shows that uh, pyrethroid resistance is widespread across the U.S. at least. Yeah. And, you know, it could be one of the reasons bed bugs have come back. They went through a bottleneck, you know, a genetic bottleneck, and that founding population, you know, they had that, that mechanism. And so now it's proliferated with bed bugs. Yeah, it seemed, seemed to have come raging back, that pyrethroid resistance. So here's a question about uh, uh, new technologies for bed bugs, and this question has to do with uh, uh, pheromone traps. Are there any pheromone traps that might be commercially available for monitoring bed bugs? Do you, do you know of any? Is that in your area? It's not really. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know if we have any products. I know yeah. we have pitfall monitors, but not pheromones. I know certainly this is something the research world has been paying attention to and working on, but mm -hmm. I don't know that we have products yet. It could be long. Sometimes these things just sneak, sneak up on you, you know, they're, they're produced by a small distributor or reformulator, and then um, you know, they could be in niche markets here. That's right. I know there are people that have been working on that worldwide, some of the chemical ecology aspects of bed bugs. So I, I suspect if there's not one available now, there, there, there will be soon. If anybody in the audience knows, of a trap, certainly you can chime in. Uh, this was, has a question on resistance to uh, uh, transport and tempered. Um, how quickly did that come about? Do you know anything about that mixture? That So that paper I talked about from the University of Kentucky, um, it was one generation. So they took out roughly 80% of the population and then the 20% that survived, they let them breed and looked at their offspring and so in that one generation they went you know down from 80 percent mortality to like 10 percent so you know a very quick jump up in resistance but that was in the lab so you know we have a, a very small gene pool for you know the gene pool is super shallow when you're only doing a small lab selection study and so you can push them to resistance a little bit quicker than would occur, or quite a bit quicker than would occur under field conditions. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> this this question has to do with. Uh, I can kind of summarize it here, but how, how quickly do you think a pest control operator would know that resistance was an issue in a bed bug uh, account? The the question is this: If treatment is rotated between two or three pesticides that bed bugs are already resistant to, but unknown to the pest control operator. How long should the PMP wait to understand that there is a pesticide resistance problem? I mean, how how quick would you know? Yeah, well, if you're doing very uh, careful monitoring, so you know, if you're not taking the population down by 50% with that first treatment, um, and then subsequent treatments, then that's a pretty good indicator. Um, bed bugs, the big problem is mm -hmm. the movement. <clears throat> And so you've got that constant migration in, in certain settings. Um, and so that confounds things a bit. But yeah, I'd say, you know, 50% population reduction is a good benchmark. The other thing, Kumar, might be if your phone rings two weeks later, you probably have a resistance problem. <laughs> uh, somebody wants to know, too, Mike, about a website that they can go check for. Um, to sign up for alerts to know about pesticide resistance. Is, it, is there any su such animal, anything like that exists? No. Um, monitoring on a national or an international basis, a reporting database? Uh, not really. It's just that, you know, you'll, you just have to pay attention to the scientific literature. You know, some of our journals like uh, Pest Management Science, Journal of Economic Entomology, um, those, those types of journals you can get get the information as soon as it comes out. Um, Michigan State University had 
the um, an insecticide resistance um, um, of <clears throat> kind of a, a website where they kept track of reports, but it was it all came back to the referee literature, the scientific literature. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that that about wraps it up, Mike. I, we both these presentations were just tremendous, and we do appreciate your time in putting the putting the presentation together and and helping out with uh, you know talking to people around the world here about the importance of managing insecticide resistance. Thanks everybody, and have a good day. Thank you.